good morning, everyone. No reply. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, I cannot describe what a huge honor it is for me to stand in front of you over here, and I'll explain to you why. Uh, please indulge me. I just want uh, you to follow a quick exercise. This is only for the students over here. Now, I want uh, every student to look towards their right and look to the person next to them. Now, I'm watching you, so please do that. Look to the right and look to the person next to you. Now, stretch a little bit and look at the entire row towards your right. Look at everyone's faces. OK, now look towards your left. Look at the person's face next to you. Do the same thing, stretch a little bit, and look at everybody towards your left. Now you can look at me. <laughs> the reason why I asked you to do this is that, trust me, some of the faces that you saw just now are going to be the next lawmakers in our country. Some of them are going to be the next cabinet ministers. And if, if you are very lucky, you have actually seen the face of one of our next prime ministers of our country. Now, this makes me very nervous. But I'm yet going to address you, and I'm very grateful that I've gotten this opportunity from MI2 to actually address you. And uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Now, since we're talking about the colonial mindset, uh, I'm going to talk to you about my life, which has a little bit of, uh, which has a little bit of, uh, 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 it's got a little bit of uh, fear in it. It's got a little bit of uh, inferiority complex in it. So I'm just going to give you an example of my life so that, uh, so that we can talk in terms of metaphors of uh, the colonial mindset. Ever since I remember, I've been a musician. I've been a musician for all my life. And uh, when I was in my 12th standard, that is when I had to decide as to what I'm going to do for the rest of my life professionally. I had made up my mind that I'm going to be a musician for the rest of my life. Music is going to be my hobby. Music is going to be my profession. And I want to do music till the day I die. I went to my father and my mother, and I told them this exact thing, that I want to do music for the rest of my life, and I want to make it my profession. As you know, with Indian parents, my father immediately thought I was absolutely crazy. He said that, how can you be a musician? You have to, you have, to have an actual job. And then after a lot of fighting with my father, a lot of heartache, a lot of pulling and pushing, uh, we reached a compromise. My father, who was a third generation doctor, he told me that we, we reached a compromise that I would finish off a degree in dental surgery. And after I finished my degree in dental surgery, I could do whatever I wanted for the rest of my life. So for the next five years, I studied dental surgery, and I finished off my degree. I got my degree certificate. I gave it to my father, and I told him that I want to be a full-time musician, and I want to be a musician for the rest of my life. So I did not practice dentistry even for a single day. Even though it's a very noble profession, it was not for me. I was a musician from the heart, and I wanted to be a musician for the rest of my life. Now, the thing is that I did not blame my father for, uh, for making me spend all that time studying a degree that I did not want to do, because my father was basing all his decisions on fear rather than passion. Now, his decisions were based out of fear of me failing, fear of me not making any money, fear of me not being looked upon well uh, by society, fear of what he would talk to my relatives about, uh, about what I do for a living, fear of me not getting a suitable wife. So his decisions were based out of fear. My decisions were based out of passion. Now imagine if my decisions were based out of fear. And after I got my degree in dental surgery, I was fearful that maybe I would not be successful at music. Let me not be a musician. Let me become a dental surgeon. Now imagine that kind of a life, that I would be going to college from, I would be going to my clinic from 9 to 5, and all that I would be thinking about in my clinic while treating my patients was when would I be able to go back home and play my guitar or play my keyboard. During this kind of a situation, would any of you like to come to me as a patient? Would any of you like to get any kind of a surgical treatment done by me? Absolutely not. Because, because I wouldn't be passionate about my work, I wouldn't be passionate about treating you. Now, there are many, many such professionals in India who are not passionate about what they're doing, who are not passionate about what they do for a living. And we, we have to make passion a driving factor in making our life decisions rather than fear. And I hope all of you do that. And, you're, and all of you being over here at the Bharatiya Chhatra Sansal shows that you all are passionate about our country and you all are doing something about it. So a big round of applause to all of you. Everybody clap for yourselves. Now, along with uh, being a musician, I've been a conservationist for all my life. I've been a very passionate environmentalist. 
Now, after I won the Grammy Award in 2015, our Prime Minister, the, our Honorable Prime Minister, Sri Narendra Modi ji, he had invited me to his office to speak to me. Now, it turned out to be almost an hour-long meeting where he suggested that I'm an environmentalist on one side, I'm a musician on the other side. Why not combine these two aspects of my life and make it into one and dedicate my life and dedicate my music towards creating awareness on environmental problems and especially on climate change, which I'm very passionate about creating awareness on. In doing this, I created an album called Shanti Samsara. Shanti Samsara is, is an album which I traveled extensively for. I traveled to over 40 countries, collaborated with over 500 musicians from various countries like, like uh, England and uh, Australia, India, Taiwan, Singapore, um, uh, Mal Malaysia, uh, everywhere basically, USA. Uh, and uh, in doing this album, I finished off the album, I showed it to our Prime Minister, he loved the album, and he launched it at the United Nations Climate Change Conference in Paris. And then of course I also got to perform this album at the United Nations General Assembly. Now while I was watching the Climate Change Conference in Paris, uh, one country that caught my attention was a country called Kiribati. Now, Kiribati is a country which is really important and significant, and all of you all should know about this country because it is going to be the first ever country in the world to be completely submerged due to climate change. It's going to be completely sub it, it, it's going to be absolutely uninhabitable in the next 30 years, and in the next 80 years, the tallest point in any part of any of the islands of Kiribati is going to be completely underwater, so the country is going to disappear from the face of the earth. Now, just to give you briefly a very, very simplistic version of what climate change is, developed nations and developing nations, we've got a lot of carbon emissions through vehicular emissions, through cars, through trucks, and then through industrialization, through burning of coal, burning of fossil fuels. All this carbon gets into the atmosphere, it, uh, it gets trapped in our atmosphere because of this, the overall temperature of our planet uh, rises. And because of this, the polar ice caps melt. And then, you know, the sea level rises, the ocean level rises, and lands go completely underwater. And it is happening right now. Now, Kiribati, as I explained, is suffering the worst consequences of climate change. They are a small country. Uh, Kiribati is a small country. They do not have any industrialization. They do not have any known carbon emissions. And they are suffering the consequences of our actions, because we are the ones who are polluting the atmosphere. And since they are low-lying islands, they are the first country to go underwater. So they are suffering the consequences of our actions. Now, this is a very, very important thing, because most of you are going to be leaders of our country. Now, our country has got 1.2 to 1.3 billion people, which means that we are almost one-sixth of the world's population. So now it's extremely important for us to be nationalists. It's important for us to be national leaders. That's our first priority. But in continuance with that, since we are forming almost one point, we are forming one sixth of the world's population, it's important for us not just to be national leaders, but to be global leaders. Because if you are going to be taking care of one sixth of the world's population, we are not just leaders of a country, but we are leaders of the world. What we do in the case that we saw in that small country like Kiribati, whatever we do is going to affect countries on the other side of the planet. So I would encourage all of you to become global leaders along with being national leaders because we are truly a global country. Now, uh, I'm just going to show you a small clip from, uh, uh, from the experiences of making this album, and it's got a small piece of uh, information on Kiribati. So, uh, Mr. Ajay, can we play the first video? absolutely real. Climate change is human-induced. Climate change is affecting all of us and our actions are affecting countries on the other side of the world.
Hi everyone, Maori, namaste. I'm Ricky Cage and today I'm in the spectacularly beautiful island country of Kiribati. Kiribati is suffering the most catastrophic effects of climate change. Let me show you this village which I'm standing in. It's a village that used to be thriving, it had a population, it had a beautiful culture. And let me show you what it is reduced to now because of man-made climate change. Take a look. Stand for the earth All of us, we're gonna make a way Thank you so much, and uh, I wanted to conclude by saying that uh, if biodiversity is a measure for the richness of a country, then India is the richest country in the world, because we are the most biodiverse in the world. Now, to showcase my passion for our country, I had created an instrumental version of our national anthem. And of course, it's, it's the most beautiful anthem in this world. Now, for the video of this uh, national anthem, whenever we do a song about national integration or a song uh, based on a national anthem or a video based on a national anthem, it's usually celebrities who are in the video or human beings in the video. I decided to showcase the true inhabitants of our country in that video. Who are the true inhabitants of our country? Who have, who have uh, entered our country and who have been living in this country long before us humans? That is the animals, the wild animals, the forests and the plants. So in creating this video, I wanted to showcase the true inhabitants of our country, that is the wildlife, the animals, the forests, and the plants of our country. So if you could indulge me for a moment, let's rise for the national anthem. And remember that we love only what, I mean, we protect only what we love. So it's important for us to fall in love with the natural world of India, the animals, the plants, so only if we fall in love with them and we showcase these kind of videos to everybody in India and make everybody fall in love with the natural world of India, with the animals in India, then we will learn to protect them because we will love them. So here we go, the second video. Please feel proud of our biodiversity. Every single shot in that video has been filmed in our own country, India. We have the most beautiful country in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ricky Cage. Really, you have seen the Pariyavaran and Bharat ka and the song of the Kaviral Dhara that you have seen. It is really beautiful. And once again, we will be able to do it with a great deal. आभार व्यक्त करेंगे रिकी केज के लिए